Imagine for a moment that it's the 1980s and you're sitting in front of your TV after a long day of hard work. You're just minding your own business, trying to relax to a nice episode of Doctor Who. When all of a sudden, this happens. That is what we call broadcast signal intrusion when an attacker hijacks the signal of a TV or radio station in order to broadcast their own content. From cryptic messages to political propaganda and sometimes even straight up porn. In this video we are going to explore a few of these cases and, more importantly, examine how the perpetrators were able to do it and whether or not you could still hijack signals in this day and age. The early days of experimental radio were like the wild west and anyone could basically broadcast whatever they wanted on whichever frequencies they wanted. That of course soon became problematic, as with more and more stations, radio frequencies became crowded and in order for your radio receiver to get a clear signal, every station must have its own frequency free of disturbances. But what would happen if two stations were broadcasting on the very same frequency? Well, if they had the same broadcasting power, the signals would simply interfere and both would be somewhat visible or audible. If however one station was significantly more powerful than the other, well they could simply drown the other signal. Interference by unauthorized parties is typically not such a big issue though, because radio and television stations broadcast via large towers or antennas that have much more power than your average consumer grade equipment. The problem is the radio link between station and tower. Because for a long time, towers were just repeaters that took a radio signal on a predetermined frequency and then rebroadcast it. This link can be captured. Armed with this knowledge, you could have almost pulled off the first major broadcast intrusion yourself. In 1977, an unknown individual simply walked up to the Hennington transmitting station, used by the UK network Southern Television, and pointed their radio transmitter at an antenna. This antenna was used to receive the network's signal straight from the studio. Because of the long distance, the signal wasn't that strong and relatively easy to override with not much power. And by transmitting on the correct listening frequency, the message was then automatically rebroadcast by the tower. Unfortunately, since in 1977 not many people had VCRs, there is no confirmed recording of the incident. And all the clips you see in various YouTube videos on the issue are actually just mock-ups. But to sum up its contents, a prankster claimed to be the representative of an alien race, the Ashtagalactic Command, urging humans to stop fighting wars. But then with the advent of cheap home VCRs in the 80s and 90s, viewers were able to record TV basically 24-7 and that's why we do have footage of a lot of crazy things from that time. Like for example this clip of Bill Clinton preparing for the 1993 address to the nation on Iraq. Is there a sound check? Do we need a sound check? Yes, sir. It's, live sound it's okay. One, two, three. Here I am, good evening. <clears throat> We're in the Oval Office. I'm being patted down. The footage you see here was actually not intended as a public broadcast, but rather distributed via a special satellite band for TV stations to be picked up and then relayed once the actual speech had begun. But of course crafty experts, nerds and insiders were sometimes lucky enough to pick up these signals. And one of these insiders is the subject of our next incident. The Captain Midnight Broadcast Signal Intrusion, in which the perpetrator did not hijack a radio tower, but rather parts of an actual satellite. In the mid-1980s, TV networks like HBO started to scramble their signal, meaning that viewers needed to purchase an expensive descrambler in addition to their high monthly fees. During that time, John R. McDougall had a satellite dish business, which suffered greatly because his customers weren't willing to pay for such expensive equipment and the high monthly rates. To survive, he had to take a second job at the Central Florida Teleport Uplink Station as a satellite engineer, where he would oversee the transmission of television program from the ground station to the satellites. Understandably, he was mad at HBO for ruining his business and with access to expensive satellite equipment at his second job, he plotted to raise awareness and call HBO and others out on their really high prices, even for that time. On the evening of April 26, 1986, after overseeing the uplink of the popular film Pee Wee's Big Adventure for a different network, McDougall prepared the equipment for the end of his shift and put the uplink dish back to his resting position. This just happened to be the exact alignment to the satellite Galaxy 1, which was used by many commercial TV networks and among them, you guessed it, HBO. 
To be more precise, HBO used Transponder 23 at a frequency of 6.385 MHz, an information that was publicly available at that time in books and magazines. In what could only be called a spur of the moment decision, he used his MG100 character generator and put a message to HBO on SMPTE color bars. And then, without any authentication whatsoever, he was able to simply broadcast his message to the satellite transponder to create this. This message could have been seen by all HBO subscribers in the eastern half of the United States, more than 7 million people. But HBO quickly realized what was happening and to regain back control of the satellite, they increased their transmitter's power from 125 watts to 2000 watts, which can actually be seen in the clip. But since McDougal was also increasing power, his signal prevailed and fearing damage to the satellite transponder, the HBO technicians eventually backed down. After realizing that he was apparently in an epic battle over satellite supremacy with HBO, McDougal started to panic. Of course, he didn't want to lose his job over this, so he quickly switched everything off to return home, pretending like nothing had happened. Eventually, he became one of the prime suspects, because the FCC realized that only very few stations had the specific character generator, as well as a powerful enough transmitter. This whole incident was something that the government, the FCC and especially the military did not like, which is why in response, satellite providers had to implement the automatic transmitter identification system. A simple method of authentication basically. Mind you, this all happened during the Cold War and fears that the Kremlin could just jam or even overtake US communications satellites this easily was at an all-time high after this incident. With all the press coverage, public discussion and governmental action after this incident, you would think that channels were now better equipped to deal with hijacking attempts. Hmm, <laughs> well, uh, the video still has a bit of runtime left, so probably not. Let's talk about the Max Headroom incident. In arguably the most interesting and well-known case of signal intrusion, an unknown perpetrator hijacked both video and audio of two major Chicago TV stations. On the evening of November 22, 1987, WGN-TV's 9 o'clock news were suddenly cut off. Both viewers and technicians only saw a black image. A few moments later, this clip appeared on their screens. A person was dressed as famous 80s TV character Max Headroom, though no sound was audible and no one really understood what was happening. Immediately, technicians at the station tried to regain control over the signal, but were facing the all too familiar issue. The station was located at Bradley Place, but the signal was sent to the antenna atop of Hancock Tower, from where it was then repeated across the area. All the attacker really had to do now to capture the signal was to be closer to the antenna and broadcast on the same input frequency as the studio, at a higher or at least similar strength. Fortunately though, technicians at the Hancock Tower were quick to act and changed the uplink frequency, meaning that the antenna looked for signal input on a different radio frequency than the hijacked one. WGN-TV was able to immediately return to their scheduled broadcasting, albeit with a more than confused audience. But apparently the attackers were not satisfied with this botched attempt and tried again. Later the same night, during a showing of a Doctor Who episode on WTTW, Chicago viewers were met with this. Now there was audio and fragments of the message could be understood. I'll spare you the details, but it's basically too deep for me ramblings on various references to WGN-TV, the first station they tried to hijack. WTTW of course also tried to stop the hijacking, but they were facing one tiny issue. Their relay antenna was atop of Sears Tower, which at the time of the signal intrusion did not have any technicians present who could have switched the uplink frequency. That meant the attackers could have potentially hijacked the signal for an even longer time, and investigators also faced greater difficulties in finding the culprits. In fact, despite huge efforts by the FCC, no culprit has ever been found and despite various rumors on Reddit regarding the local Chicago freaking scene, we aren't any closer to finding the truth. We are now in current year and about 95% of all TV worldwide made the jump from analog to digital. That means better picture, better sound, but no more simple hijacking by overriding the signal. Between the 90s and today, major hijacking incidents have become more rare but um, not unheard of. And the 2008 Stoven incident is actually one of the most hilarious examples of more recent intrusions. 
No radio signal had to be overwritten from the outside and no sophisticated encryption had to be cracked. Members of the art collective Stoven simply stumbled upon a remote webcam in the mountains of the Czech Republic, used by a weather channel. There they broke into the station, pulled out a cable, put that into a compatible video player and the result was the following clip, broadcast to the masses on Czech television's CT2. This incident is not only unique in that the perpetrators publicly admitted to their actions, they even made a documentary about it, in which they detail the complete process from producing the fake video to physically hijacking the camera broadcast station. But the most interesting entry point was probably used for the 2013 zombie invasion hoax, where audio on at least three local US TV stations was interrupted and replaced by a warning that the dead had risen from their graves. Civil authorities in your area have reported that the bodies of the dead are rising from their graves and attacking the living. Follow the messages on screen that will be updated as information becomes available. As some of you might have already noticed by the audio, in this case the innovative entry point used by the perpetrator was the emergency alert system. In the US all stations are required to support that system and relay messages, which could be anything from actual weather warnings to not so actual reports of an incoming missile strike. To receive these warnings, stations use devices such as the DASDAQ, which as it just so happens, recently had its root certificate leaked. This leak, in combination with the fact that stations frequently use default credentials and can't be bothered to actually change passwords, meant that the hacker was able to quite easily gain access to a device that could, well, <laughs> once again just override a station's audio signal at the press of a button. But it gets even better, because the hacker's message spread further than even he intended. Some stations serve as entry points to other stations, meaning that whenever there is an EAS warning at station A, station B's system recognizes that and then rebroadcasts the same message. This is exactly what happened the following day, when the Michigan radio station Z93 reported on the zombie hoax. They played the whole intrusion, but little did they know that the high-pitched noise at the beginning is what sets off an actual live alert. Therefore the connected TV station, WKBT, had its programming interrupted by the reporting on the hoax and after that even some comments by the radio hosts who really had, uh, well, <laughs> no idea what they were doing. Information becomes available. I so mean, that's basically somebody, the had to, somebody, somebody really had to know what they were doing to be able to hack into this yeah, system the TV station. and they play it over the, you know... It's insane. I uh, mean, first of all, just so to conclude this video, let's ask ourselves this. How relevant is TV nowadays? Would something like the Max Headroom incident carry the same weight it did when TV was about the only source for news and entertainment for most people? What about in 10 years? The days of linear broadcast television are likely numbered and headlines are generated when hackers hijack Twitter accounts for Bitcoin scams. Hacking seems to be a lot more profit oriented and unless someone manages to replace all Netflix streams with the infamous review of Boku no Pico, I don't think these older incidents will ever be matched in a day where news and entertainment are so scattered and diverse. Oh and uh, to answer the clickbait question on my video thumbnail, how to hack TV, uh, you don't because not unlike this video, no one is ever going to see it.